Welcome to the final installment of the winter NEK Tiffy Talk series. Yes, round of applause. I know it's really weird being in a bar in the daylight on a Tuesday. No, it's not. Some of us are used to it. But I love to see all these faces here. We're going to have a great night tonight. We have two local legends telling us tales that are really important to them. The first, Diana Mara Henry. She's going to tell us about Agent Andre, a secret spy from World War II. She just published a book. She's going to tell you all about it. I don't want to spoil any more. And the reason we're here tonight is because we try to establish more of a community by storytelling in the Northeast Kingdom. We do a lot of outreach through our jobs. Or my job, I do a lot of outreach. I knock on doors, I talk to people. There are fascinating creatures and characters in the Northeast Kingdom. And there are not enough venues or avenues for people to come together and share. After COVID, people seem to be a little spooked and they just hang in their house and we want to reverse that. We want to kick that trend. We want to get people out of their house, down to local watering holes, down to the bar, down to the restaurants, and engaging with their neighbors and strangers and hearing tales. So this is the last of this year's Tipsy Talks. We may have a few spur up over the summer at some other satellite spots like Park and Pie or The Gap or maybe back at Jasper's. And what we do about Tipsy Talks is we rely on people like you to tell stories. So if you think you have a story to tell, I'm looking at you, Eric, then find me and we'll get you on the schedule for next year. We really, really, really rely on all of you. Nobody wants to listen to me tell the same story six times, like my grandfather. You know, like with those ones, you just kind of sit there and enjoy it because you're like, hey, he's only going to be around for so long. I got I to gotta get every little iteration of the story I could possibly get. But you don't want to listen to me tell the same story. So without further ado, let's welcome Diana Meyer Henry to tell us about Agent Andre. Oh. <laughs> um, yes, Agent Andre was the name of my book. I've been working on this book for 30 years since I met Andre. And, <laughs> uh, so it was Agent Andre, and I just changed publishers, so that's a whole other okay. story. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, so this is the new publisher, Chiselbury Press, and uh, it's in England. So it'll be published uh, in the fall, October. So, um, so the title sort of says it all. I am Andre, German Jew, French resistance fighter, British spy. And um, this was Andre pretty much around the time that I met him. I met him because I was interested and had been studying the Knoxweiler concentration camp in France for about. 10 years before I met him. And uh, his son introduced me to him. This is the concentration camp when I was there in 2016. The school group coming in through the, the front entrance. So this is an earlier uh, photograph of Andre. And these are some of his, um, some of his titles the way people knew him. So after the war, a lot of his agents wrote to him as Sheikh Kamahad. But they also wrote to him as my captain, my lieutenant. Uh, and his numbers, this was his uh, agent number in, in George Plans Group 31. This was his secret intelligence service number. He was an agent for secret intelligence service. Uh, he also had aliases like Martin, Turquoise, and so on. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how he appears with all those different names. It occurred to me, I had to do an author's video for the previous publisher, and it occurred to me that um, I've always been interested in imposter stories. And a good spy is a good imposter. So I think Andre was a very good imposter because he worked as a spy for about 15 months before he was caught, which is a long time for a spy in World War II. These were Andre's places. He was born uh, in Munich, which is sort of the birthplace of the Nazi party. Oh, yeah. 
Um, and then he moved to Dusseldorf with his family. His family uh, had shoe stores. You'll see some pictures of that. And then eventually he ended up in Han, which is over there toward the point of France, which is Brittany. And then uh, from Saint-Pavieux, which is at the very tip, he crossed the channel to England in January of 42. And was trained in London with a secret intelligence service. And then came back to um, Han and was arrested. Uh, was in prison in Paris, in Pen, for about 18 months, and then he ended up in Nassweiler concentration camp, and then in Dachau for the end of the war, from 40, September 44 to uh, spring of 45, when Dachau was liberated. So, and this place, Boyer en is where the family moved from Dusseldorf right after uh, Hitler came to power in 1933. He was born in 1915. These are his parents. They had come from Poland to live in Germany. His father, Max, fought in World War I, and when he saw Hitler coming to power in 1924, when Hitler tried to overthrow the 23 tried to overthrow the, uh, the German government in something called the Beer Hall Putsch. So the revolution, his attempt to overthrow the government started in a beer garden, I guess sort of like now, <laughs> except he had a few stormtroopers with him. So Max immediately, uh, Hitler was put in prison for about a year, in 24, during which time he wrote in my Kampf his plan for world domination and extermination of the Jews. And Max immediately started to talk against Hitler. So he, he went around Germany to World War I veterans associations, like Veterans of Foreign Wars, and, you know, that kind of group, Foreign Legion. And uh, he was speaking out against Hitler. So he's really part of the German resistance in a way. Uh, in 33, when Hitler came to power, Max had already taken out visas for the family in 1924 and moved to France. Uh, this is Andre with his sister Mady as a child, and Andre with his sled, and his mom Regina with Andre seemingly wearing Lederhosen or something like that, some German outfit. <laughs> um, his mother's Brothers had been officers in the Polish army, including one which was a very high-ranking officer named Joseph Paulson. Oh. So uh, one of Andre's friends, the first part of the book is his memoir. So the second part of the book is the rest of the story, everything Andre didn't tell that I found out later. <laughs> But in the first part of the book, he tells his story. And he talks about a man that he was friends with in Germany, whose father ran the, the newspaper, the daily newspaper in the city of Dusseldorf. And uh, his friend, Ewald Schmidt, uh, was, uh, the, the whole family was not pro-Nazi. So Ewald ended up on the front. Uh, they knew he was not a Nazi. They sent him to the Russian front, and he was made to defend an impossible position, and was killed. Um, and after the family moved to France, uh, Andre got married. He loved tennis. He's a real tennis player. So he joined the miners tennis club. Miners, as in coal miners. There were a lot of Polish coal miners in that community in France. And they had stores. Uh, and he sold tennis items and ping pong items, special discounts for groups. <laughs> this was the shoe store in, uh, I think, Dusseldorf. And you can see Max Scheinman's name up here at the So France, when the Germans uh, invaded France, which took them about three weeks till capitulation. 
they took over the part of France where Andre's family lived, which is the pink all the way at the north at the top, the deep pink. And so his parents had to cross uh, into Paris to uh, get away from the Germans as much as they could. Um, but Andre mostly occupied or operated in the, that uh, western part. And you can see along the coast are the forbidden zones where no one could go. So, he, you know, it was, it was very difficult to conduct activities there. And the activities were very important because his agents were photographing the coastlines and they were reporting on submarine bases and they were reporting on, you know, which, which areas were mined and which weren't. So it was, it was especially difficult because it was occupied by Germany and also those coastal areas were forbidden zones. So this is right before the outbreak of war. Uh, Andre with his parents on the left and his aunt on the, uh, in the middle. So as I was doing this book, I realized that Andre had two uncles who were very world famous illusionists. And um, the posters are, are really beautiful posters. And you can also see the family resemblance and some of them, you know, very striking. So um, his most famous uncle was Chevalier Ernest Thorne. And his mother's name was Regina Thorne, so he was from his mother's side of the family. So in 39, when France went to war, actually in 38, he, um, he joined the French army. He and his father turned in their German passports. They both tried to enroll in the French army. His father was too old, but they took Andre. And you can see here his first army enrollment booklet, which is under his real name. He was born Joseph Scheinman. So he enrolled as Joseph Scheinman. And it shows that he was born in Germany and um, that he was born born 1915 in Munich, in Germany. And at the top it says, does not possess French nationality. So, but they took him in the army. And then what they often did in the French army, the Foreign Legion and so on, is they gave their fighters uh, French names. So they would take the names, for instance, of children who had died and who had already been registered at birth, and they would give them those names. And so in Andre's case, it was Andre Maurice Pulvé, and he had his parents had both died conveniently. So you know the parents of the child. So you know he had an identity, complete identity, born in a different place. And he said he became so used to Andre that if someone said Joseph, he wouldn't even turn around. He wouldn't blink. Mm -hmm. He was totally Andre. And he kept the name Andre till the end of his life. So his birth certificate says Andre Joseph. This is his parents, um, you know, right toward the outbreak of war near Paris. Uh, Max had taken his daughter, Beatty, over to the States in 1939 to get her away from war. He knew that war was coming. And he married her to a cousin <laughs> whose name was also Scheinman. So she kept the name Beatty Scheinman all her life. She married a doctor in New Bedford, and they tried to uh, get a visa for their parents for her parents. And um, so they, Andre kept this letter, which says, I don't know if you can read it. Can you read it from where no. you are? No. OK, this is from the State Department. And it's dated uh, June 23rd, with, uh, June 23rd, 1941. 
With reference to your letter of June 16, 1941, regarding the visa cases of your parents-in-law, Max and Regina Scheinman, it's written to Dr. Sidney Scheinman, who is an American citizen, you are advised that a new procedure in connection with the issuance of visas will become effective on July 1. It's suggested that after July 1, you may wish to communicate with the visa division regarding the cases in which you are now interested. Sincerely yours, Chief Visa Division. So a year and a half, a year and a month later, uh, Max and Regina were uh, were killed either in Auschwitz or in Maidenhead, but they had been shipped there for Paris. <coughs> So <laughs> Andre tried to fight for three weeks for France, and then he was in a prisoner of war camp in Rennes, in Brittany, and uh, he realized that all the prisoners, French prisoners, were going to be shipped to Germany. And in fact, a million and a half French prisoners did actually work in Germany for, um, for the rest of the war. So he escaped. He got a. He found a fellow prisoner who was a uh, forger. He got him to forge a release, and he got out of jail, out of the prisoner of war camp. And so he was looking for work. He went to the French National Railroads. He became an interpreter for the manager at the French National Railroads hub in Brittany and Han, which was, you know, a very big city on, on the uh, western coast. And uh, while he was there, he reports that he was part of Group 31 with 31 AQ. And uh, I don't think his, I don't think his, his uh, secret intelligence service handlers ever knew who he really was. We'll never know because secret intelligence service does not release any files. But. Um, Everyone knew him as André Maurice Pelouvé, a French. Uh, so this is his past from uh, a lot of his documents he kept. And so amazingly enough, he, hit, he must have hidden this document. He kept his, uh, this is part of his uh, translator past. And uh, he also signed up at the university in Rennes. Because how come he spoke such great German that he could be a German translator for the French National Railroads management? So he, he enrolled in a master's program and he said, well, you know, I've been studying German for years and I'm going for an advanced degree, so I know German. Huh. So this is part of a document that he, it was one of his assignments, translating German into French. Well, his French wasn't as good as his German. <laughs> So it's full of mistakes, and he got a failing grade. He got 6.5 over 20. Yeah. And, but, and, she, and the teacher says, this work is much inferior to your previous one. Well, the previous assignment, I figure, he, he had gotten the help of a French girlfriend to fix his assignment. The problem with a French girlfriend from the university and a student at the university, by this time he's 25, she was probably five years younger, the problem was that she wanted him to join her resistance group. And he said, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. I'm, you know, I have, a, I have an important job. You know, I need my job. <laughs> I'm not going to jeopardize it by getting into some kind of wild scheme with the resistance. Well, meanwhile, he was running a much bigger network, which included her network, her student group network. But, you know, in the resistance, you, you kept walls so that people wouldn't be able to, you know, be tortured and reveal others. So she dropped it. <laughs> it's like, what a dud, right? <laughs> so I'll go, I'll go, you know, past these documents in which he talked about what he did. These are a couple of the girls who, uh, whose parents owned a hotel where there was a lot of meetings going on for the resistance. They were both in the resistance, uh, both sent to concentration camps. One of them died. 
Uh, she said, Simon, who wrote a book later, said, it's true one had to be a bit crazy and have faith enough to move mountains, to fight against an adversary who was winning on all fronts, occupying all of Europe. Uh, these are some of the ledgers that the French government kept after the war about who was in the resistance and how they came to be there and so on. This woman, Marie Jules, uh, whose mother uh, was recruited, it says her mother was recruited by 31 AQ, which is Andre, right? And so she wrote later to him and she said in 2000, she said, I learned through your, uh, your story, his memoir, which is part of his book, of your agent, of your secret service, your secret agent actions, of which I only knew a part. So, you know, he wasn't telling everyone what he was doing, obviously. Uh, and I congratulate you, you know, be assured of my esteem and my very old friendship. Which we, with which we connected during the year 1941-1942 in Han. This is a, a, a schema of the, some of the resistance leaders in Brittany. In, and you can see Will Bortz, sort of in the middle, the top little white box. And then under it is Turpin, uh, Andre's boss and Purve, which is Andre, and some of the other people he talks about in this memoir. Uh, so among the documents that uh, his son revealed to me, <laughs> in, 20, in 2018, I've been working on this book since 1994, in 2018 his son called me from West Roxbury near Boston, and he said, I found a box of my dad's papers, and I'm like, Really? And he said, yeah. He said, uh, of course, you know, they're all in French. And I'm like, well, that's not a problem. <laughs> so I drove down there that weekend, and I still have the box of papers, which I'm looking for a place to archive. But among the papers are some maps, including this one of Paris, which I thought, think is intriguing because, you know, it's a map of Paris. But then there are some, some enhancements in pen. So I don't know if that was some of the you know, routes that they took around Paris to you know, meet up with people or what. Mysteries remain. This is a dropping zone. This is a map of a dropping zone. So there were a lot of flights coming over from England with arms, with cigarettes, with chocolate. <laughs> all the necessaries for a country at war, and also dropping in agents and radio operators to radio back information to England. England, by the way, was supporting the resistance in all the occupied countries of Europe. And this is one of the problems with getting early networks in France recognized, because the French don't really want to, you know, make too big a deal about the fact that the British were supporting their resistance, at least for the first two years of the war. They're just starting now to admit to that mm -hmm. and to study it and document it. This is the railroad station where Andre worked. And he could, from his window, he could look out and he could see a bench. So what Andre said to his boss is he figured his boss out immediately to be part of a, you know, be part of a network. And uh, so that was in September of 1940 when he went to work for him, two months after the fall of France. He said, look, he said, tell you what, I want to work with you. He said, give me a nice office, give me a rug on the floor, give me a secretary. The, and give me a special title, and the Germans will be really impressed, and they'll be very flattered. And so he began to, you know, this boss gave him all that, and of course he knew the German mentality, having grown up German. So he was spot on about that. The Germans loved him. I mean, he said, no, 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 I'm not going home, don't invite me for dinner. You know, you wouldn't want 
to fraternize with me if I was occupying your country, but, you know, I'll work with you. So, working with the Germans, the Germans needed the French railroads because they were shipping, you know, all kinds of industrial supplies and agricultural supplies to Germany. They were really stripping all the occupied countries of their wealth, and they were also bringing soldiers in and out. And so Andre was able, from his position at the French railroads, to report on all that. And at a certain point, the Germans' high commands needed an interpreter. So they picked Andre. They said, we're going for a three-week tour. We're going to you know, visit the installations, the naval bases, the fuel depots. We need an interpreter. And he said, oh, I, I, you know, I can't leave my job. You know, I mean, I got a good job here. So they said, well, we'll talk to your boss. So, of course, his boss, who was really head of the network, said, uh, well, I don't know if I can spare him for that long. You know, anyway, they twisted their arms and they got him to go with them, which was very valuable. And so that was the role that Andre played. As he said to his boss, I'll protect you. You won't have to get into the nitty gritty. I will meet with people and I, I will be the one that if they catch, you know, they won't catch you. So these are two, two men that he met on that bench because these two men came to his boss and they said, you know, we're working with London and, you know, his boss said, no, 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 I'm not involved. You know, if you want to talk to Andre, my interpreter, he'll go out and meet you on the bench, but, you know, none of this business around here. So Andre met Yves Lutac and Joël Lutac, and those two were actually connected with de Gaulle, and so they were going to England at, uh, in uh, January, of, beginning of January 42, they went to England, and they took Andre with him. They went by canoe first from the beaches, and then by motor torpedo boat. So they went over to where that red eye, red arrow is. There. Um, I'll skip over this. It's kind of fun, but uh, so they left from the Notax home. This is their mother, Ethan Joy's mother and um, Yvonne Lutax. And so Andre writes, uh, he wrote a eulogy for her and uh, a tribute. And in the tribute he wrote, um, a considerable and attentive hostess, she provided comforting provisions that were already scarce. Yvonne Lutax participated in all our departures. She pulled out the canoe, hidden less than 20 yards from a house full of German soldiers. It was to take us four miles out to meet the English speedboat. When several departures had to take place at once, she would lead us to a promontory, carrying a grenade in each hand, ready to do anything to ensure our departure, pacing along the cliffs with those of us who were to leave later, and walking us around the German sentries. And she would not go home until the last of us was embarked at last. Uh, so, in England, when he went, he basically traded with the Notax. So he gave the Notax and the French all of his sabotage agents, which Joel would, says were 300, and then there were 500, and then there were 2,000 people. Joel had a, you know, he started the network in November. That's when he met Andre. And by January, he was claiming to have thousands of agents. Andre always talked about 300 agents in his, you know, in, under his purview. Uh, so Andre gave the French uh, all of his sabotage agents, and he came back to England with a new mission for intelligence, and he was going to have a new name, Turquoise, and he was going to have his own radio operation. He really was much more interested in intelligence, which uh, is known as hush-hush, 
and Joël Letac was really into sabotage, which is known as bang bang. <laughs> so it was it was always awkward for the secret services who were into intelligence, people like Andre, who were hush hush, and the people like Joël Letac who were into sabotage. Uh, Eve, Joël's brother, was much more into intelligence and propaganda, the underground press, and Andre and Eve stayed friends a long time. This is Andre's boss, Uncle Tom. This is from his little address book from after the war, right after the war. Uncle Tom's uh, name, and one of Andre's pseudonyms or aliases was called the nephew, because he worked for Uncle Tom. And um, so he was often in books about the resistance that either they mentioned him by name or they mentioned the nephew, which is him. So his bosses were Thomas Green, it's really hard to see this even for me, but the Paris before the war, the Secret Intelligence Service in Britain was running, you know, their intelligence operations. I guess just the way they do in Washington, D.C. or any capital in the world. And this map shows that the Paris office was run by Dunderdale and Green. So Dunderdale was the man above Green. When Andre was in England, he was outfitted with, um, by the Secret Intelligence Service. They had theatrical designers who worked for the movies and the theater. And these professionals would costume and um, you know, create disguises. So we probably have these because, you know, on, the pictures were made in London and Andre sent copies to his sister Mady. So that was the only thing Mady got throughout the war from her brother. Was these pictures from London and, uh, you know, she wondered what he was up to. <laughs> and, you know, he's wearing his majesty's service, you know, sailor outfit and banker and whatever. So the mystery remained till the end of the war. We, there are a lot of documents, not about Andre, but about the Lutax. And in these documents, you can see Andre's, uh, his aliases. Or you'll see Andre Maurice and then the privé part is whited out. And then it'll say AKA Le Neveu. So he's there, but not a full name. Or like in this meeting where they're planning the return to France, they've got, you know, all the British, and then they've got Joël, Le Tac, and then at the bottom is A and Other, which we're pretty sure is Andre. <laughs> but because he was secret intelligence, you know, even at the time, they weren't giving his name. So I'll just run through these because I'm we're at the end, basically, but here's the head of secret intelligence for France, uh, Dunderdale, and his address, Caxton Street, was, was his main operating headquarters. Um, so here we are with a, a letter of uh, reference from his boss, Thomas Green, who describes what he was doing and he wrote this letter uh, on the 22nd of June, 1945. So Andre had been back from Dachau for a concentration camp for a month. So he got a letter of reference from his secret intelligence service boss, which could be useful because if someone was very discreet in the resistance, after the war, people might think that they had been collaborating. So, uh, you know, and some people were killed, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because they weren't known. So he got the letter on the 22nd of June, and the same day he got a receipt saying that, uh, certifying that Paul V, André Maurice, with his fake uh, birth date and where he was born, was given the uh, sum of five, uh, was given the sum of, had returned the sum of 500,000 French francs that were given to him on the 1st of February, 1942, to accomplish a resistance mission in occupied France. And Andre had kept that, had, had hidden that money 
and all of his documents. So the Germans never knew what he did. He actually told them, um, he told them when he, this, this is the, the deposit that was made right a month before in May of that money when they got it out of hiding. Uh, but he was, he was told that, um, where was I going with this? Uh, I just, I'm just, this is the head of their network, Group 31, George Franz. And uh, this is a map of the concentration camps. So you can see Natzweiler over there all the way, you know, uh, to the east. That part of France was taken back by Germany, as Germany. So, um, you know, they had to have something there. This is the way the camp looks today. Most of the barracks have been taken down. They just have the uh, crematorium at the bottom and the, uh, the lab, you know, the vivisection lab or whatever they were doing. Mingling. Yeah, creepy experiments, mostly on Roma and Sinti. And I think I've come to the end of the time, but um, I just, you know, this was the first they were, when they, they were sent to Natzweiler, the camp, under the Nacht und Nebel Decree, which is the Night and Fog Decree. They actually, Hitler actually was thinking of Richard Wagner, and then I think Das Rheingold, the gold of the Rhine. Uh, there's a man who throws out a curse, and the curse is Nacht und Nebel. And the character that he's cursing disappears from stage in a puff of smoke. And when the resistance was rising up all over Europe, uh, Hitler, in one of his big, you know, command meetings, said not to Neville. And Keitel, who was head of the armies, uh, append this decree in which political prisoners would be sent to the concentration camps never heard of again. Mm -hmm. And it was meant to instill fear in the, in the local population. Because if someone was publicly executed, more resistance would come up. But if people didn't know what had happened to them, it was even more terrifying. And this is called a uh, crime against humanity of enforced disappearance, which, you know, as you know, has been used unfortunately many countries mm. up to our day. So I think I should stop here maybe and take questions. I think we're at the end of the time, right? So yeah, thank you for listening to this story. Yeah, Quick question, you got to know him. With all these things he went through, what was he like as a person? He was, um, he was very, very soft-spoken, very gentlemanly, very gentlemanly, uh, kind. He spoke to people in a way they could understand. So his memoir is written, you know, it's written very, you know, on the level of anyone could understand it. But, even little details. And I, sometimes I read his memoir and I think, ah, you know. Like, I just found a detail, a verification for the detail. He said, the, in, the radio operator I was going to be given and was going to be sent back from England after me was called uh, Nelson. His code name was Nelson, because he had worked on the Nelson. And I'm like, ah. You know, and then I just read a book by another resistor, Pierre Hentick. And Hentick says, you know, we didn't have an operator, radio operator at the time, but another network, a radio operator let us, you know, send a message for us. And his name was Nelson. And he'd been on the Nelson in the Mediterranean for the past year. So whatever he said, even if he said it with a light touch, there was always, you know, it was always true. It's quite amazing. He did something um, personally.
for, for my daughter, which I thought was a beautiful thing. The last time I went to see him, he was in bed. I was with my daughter, and he was in a care home. I think he was in his final illness in 2001. My daughter was with me, and she was 14, and she was a wild child. And she had, you know, was living a very, very bad situation. And, you know, he knew her for a couple of years already. She came up to his bedside, and he took her hand, and he kissed it the way a Frenchman kisses a lady's hand, you know, kissing the back of her hand. And, and I thought it was so charming and so beautiful that he, you know, he knew what she was doing. You know, he, he knew the troubles that she was in. And, and he treated her the way, you know, he hoped she would be something. So. <laughs> but when I worked on this memoir with him, I, I put it into chapters, I put it into paragraphs. I got his CV. I had no idea about the existence. So the questions that I could have asked him, I never got to ask. But I did get to later see the National Archives in France and England. And then I did get, I found at least 15 books that mention him, which he never knew about. So, um, so I got to know the rest of the story because in the documentation and then the box of papers that his son gave me or lent me, uh, and his son said, "Oh, you know, I threw out a lot of them." I'm like, oh. <laughs> "What? Which ones did you throw out? Oh, what basis?" Anyway, there are 250 pages of documents, correspondence from his agents about other agents because after the war he worked for the resistance for longer than he worked during the war, because for five years after the war, he registered his agents in the French government ledgers, like the ones you saw, for pensions and honors. And if they were in networks that weren't being recognized by the French government, he put them into his network, you know? So it's like, you know, it's like they all made it. Everyone that he could retrieve you know, made it into the ledgers of his last network, which was the Lutac network. So although he'd worked for British networks for, you know, the, the bulk of maybe 12 out of 15 months, or 13 out of 15 months as a secret agent uh, for the British, the last network he went to London with was a, was a French network. And so he became the registrar for that network, the Lutax network. And he put them all into the Lutax network. So. Any other questions? Yeah. What did he do uh, the rest of his life? So the rest of so after the war, some of these papers show that he actually traveled to England with passport number 303 in December of 45. He traveled to American Air Force base, bases uh, as, as an intelligence officer. Um, you know, I think it's possible that he would have wanted to work for the French government. And much of his original documentation as a resistor was under the name of Alpine Privé. He didn't get his birth certificate from Germany until 49. And at that point, he had all his records changed to Scheinman. But I think the fact that, you know, when he, when, I, I'm not sure. I really don't think, tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think that as a German Jew, he would have gotten any of the responsibilities, or as many, in the resistance with the British or after the war registering these agents if people had known he was a German Jew. There was one man who knew he was a German Jew. But, you know, I, I think he would have liked to do that. But instead he worked, well, he was in the army for a couple of years when he came back with a lot of medical reviews. And then, uh, and then uh, he, he, uh, he applied for a job with UNESCO, doing provisioning for their, you know, clubs and so on. And 
eventually he went back to um, he went back to his you know his parents job which was storekeeping and he came to this country I was going to tell you he signed himself out of the French army because he knew that they were going to reassign him the, the head their commanding officer didn't like the resistance and so he was going to send all of this personnel, army personnel, that he knew were in the resistance, he was going to send them to you know, China. And in no way was Andre going to go to Vietnam or Cambodia. So he signed his commanding officer's name to a release form. <laughs> signed himself out of the army. And, you know, a few months or a year or so later, he meets a higher up in the army who says to him, what happened to you? You're not in the army anymore? And he said, well, you know, uh, you know, they were both in the resistance. And the guy said, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to make it official. <laughs> and so, you know, and he continued in the French reserves. Even in this country, he, he was in the French reserves at Fort Drum. But, um, yeah, so he came to this country in 51. And uh, with his wife, who was also in intelligence, she was an operator for uh, for the RAF, and she was she she would lure German pilots. She spoke she was from Russia, but she spoke perfect German, so she would lure German pilots to you know give mis misdirect them and in flights over England. It's called actually Operation Corona. <laughs> But it was called, it was a spoofing and jamming operation. And so they would, the pilots would have their coordinates for where they were going to drop their bombs in England. And then she would get on and she would say, you know, this is the Luftwaffe, you know, your assignment has been changed. The coordinates are, you know, somewhere in a field, not in the middle of the city. And then sometimes the German Luftwaffe operators would be listening. And they'd be telling the pilot, no, no. Don't listen to the Englander, you know. And so, so anyway, lots of lots of interesting things, even about his wife and how they, how they married. He came to this country. He opened a baby store, baby goods store, in uh, near New Bedford, and he lived in New Bedford for 50 years near his wow. sister, maybe. Yeah, that's good news. But I think his greatest his greatest defeat that overshadowed. You know all the daring do and the the, uh, the victory over the Germans that he had achieved. His greatest defeat was losing his parents in in the concentration camps, and the fact that uh, he blamed himself all his life to the end of his life. You know that I mean, could he have saved them? I don't know. Thank you. Diana says she's never given this talk before. Can we get another round of applause? Where can we find your book? Coming out in October. Okay, so the book will be published by Chiselbury Press, unless this one also <laughs> disappears. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so it's it's um, it's going to be October, September, October. Publisher says. And it'll be printed on demand in this country, which means that you won't have to pay for shipping from England. <laughs> and if your friends and relatives in Australia want to get a copy, it'll be printed there too. So it's, it'll be in all the English speaking. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.